Who really is Melisandre? Is she the two-dimensional religious zealot she appears to be, or is there something more to her? And is she really even human at all? Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek. On this channel we cover George R. R. Martin's world of A Song of Ice and Fire in depth, as well as other great fantasy worlds like Lord of the Rings and The Witcher. If that sounds good, there's a subscribe button in the bottom right of your screen. We often think about Melisandre as being the Red Woman, priestess of R'hllor, which she obviously is, but the truth is she is not a typical Red Priest, far from it. And when asked, George R. R. Martin has said that he thinks that she, along with Varys, is the most misunderstood character in the whole series, which begs the question, what are we not understanding about her? Well, we know that we haven't got her completely wrong, because we have a point of view chapter for her in A Dance with Dragons. From what we read there, we know that she does actually believe in the Lord of Light as completely as she seems to, so we're not misunderstanding that. And she is convinced that Stannis is Azora High Reborn, so her base motivations seem to be exactly as we thought. So what are we misunderstanding? I want to suggest three key things that we might be getting wrong. First, although she is the most prominent Red Priest in the story, she isn't a good example of one. In fact, she's probably viewed by the R'hllor authorities as a bit of a heretic and a liability. Let's start by pointing out something that we never see her do. She doesn't seem to contact the church hierarchy at any point for advice or guidance, or speak to any other Red Priests. In the books, she never meets Thoros, or even mentions to anyone that there is an entire massive religion of fanatics who would be willing to die for Azor Ahai Reborn, which is perhaps an important detail that someone like Stannis might find interesting, given how frozen and depleted his army is starting to get. The religion aspect of her faith seems almost completely irrelevant to her outside of the rituals, magic and ceremonies that she does and those around her do. It's as if she doesn't consider herself part of the wider religious order at all. She went to Dragonstone in the first place of her own volition, not sent on a mission by the church authorities like Thoros was to King's Landing or Mokoro to Meereen. She becomes convinced that Stannis is Azor Ahai reborn, and decides to support him on her own, not travel back to Volantis to try to persuade the Faith as a whole to support him. This is important because the ultimate battle between good and evil and the identity of the hero, Azor Ahai Reborn, that will fight for humanity are the central tenets of R'hllor worship's apocalyptic preachings. By the time we reach A Dance with Dragons and Tyrion passes through the massive Temple of R'hllor in Volantis, he witnesses them preaching of ancient prophecy, a hero destined to deliver the world from darkness, and Daenerys is specifically named. The people, thousands of them, are whipped into a fury over it. The worshippers of R'hllor will play a massive role in supporting Danny as she heads west, believing her to be their saviour, and Melisandre will be opposed to that. So the first misconception we may have of Melisandre is that she is a priest of R'hllor. She may have been trained by the faith, wear the robes and believe it absolutely, but to the church itself she may well be little more than a troublesome heretic, a one-woman splinter movement, completely cut off from the rest of her religion. And the second way we may be misunderstanding Melisandre is by assuming that she is a normal human, because all the facts suggest that she isn't. We see hints of this everywhere. There's her age, of course. It's not clear exactly how old she is in the books, but she's certainly unnaturally old. Carice Van Houten, the actress who played her on the TV show, seems to have been told that she was 400 years old. And in the books, Melisandre thinks about having studied her art for years beyond count. At the very least, she seems to be a lot older than she looks. And she doesn't eat much at all, which seems like a throwaway point until you read this section from her only point of view chapter in A Song of Ice and Fire. Food. Yes, I should eat. Some days she forgot. R'hllor provided her with all the nourishment her body needed, but that was something best concealed from mortal men. This could just be her being forgetful or overly pious, but taken at face value, it seems that when she eats, it's primarily for others' benefit, so they don't realise that she doesn't need to. Instead, another power, one that she clearly believes to be R'hllor, is supernaturally giving her the energy and nourishment she needs. 
What's even more intriguing in that passage, though, is her offhanded way of thinking about other people as mortal men. That's only the kind of thing you think if you are not mortal. And she doesn't sleep much, either. She says that she has no time for it, and sits up at night just staring into the flames. She may doze for an hour or so, she says, but no more, and longs for the day when she doesn't even need that. Again, this is not normal. And the not normal things keep coming. She is supernaturally warm. Where she walks on the snow and ice, the ice begins to drip. When she gets visions in the flames, black blood steams down her thigh. This isn't just someone who knows a few spells. This is inhuman. Her body doesn't need the things normal human bodies need. It behaves differently, and she doesn't even seem to see herself as mortal. This isn't perhaps shocking in such a magical universe, but it is interesting that there are such clear parallels here to at least two other characters in the books, Lady Stoneheart and Beric Dondarrion. Both seem to not need food or much sleep, both are strongly linked to the Red God, both seem to be immortal-ish, and both are called by George R. R. Martin Fire Whites, people brought back from death and animated by fire rather than ice. Could Melisandre also be a fire white? It's certainly possible. It would explain why she seems to view herself as being different to normal mortals, why she has these inhuman abilities to not eat or sleep, why she has black blood, and also why she has such unshakable belief in the god she will have believed brought her back from the dead. And let's face it, if she isn't a fire white, there's something even more inhuman about her. So, the second way we misunderstand Melisandre is to view her as a normal human. She isn't. The third way we misunderstand her, and perhaps the thing George R. R. Martin was thinking of most when he said that she was misunderstood, is to view her as a two-dimensional religious fanatic. Don't get me wrong, she clearly is a religious fanatic who has done terrible things in the name of her faith, but when we finally get a chapter in the books from her perspective, we see another side to her, a compassionate side, and perhaps even a tragic backstory. It's fair to say that Melisandre does not come across as compassionate. She pushes remorselessly for Edric Storm's sacrifice, and seems not to care about those who oppose her or her agenda. But when we do get that POV chapter, it becomes immediately apparent how obsessed she is with her own image and how she presents herself to others. She walks around with guards believing it is a sign of authority, the trappings of power, she thinks. She carries powders and potions to make her magic look more impressive, flames changing colour and so on. And clearly, doing magic itself causes her great physical pain, but she never shows it, thinking people would interpret it as a sign of weakness. And she has doubts about her interpretation of what she sees in the flames that she rarely admits to. As part of this... She hides her compassionate side, again presumably thinking it will be interpreted as a sign of weakness. We discover that she specifically requested that Davos's youngest son, Devon, be left at the wall as her attendant, rather than to go to war with Stannis. Why? Well, this is what she thinks. In truth, he was here because Melisandre had asked for him. The four eldest sons of Davos Seaworth had perished in the battle on the Blackwater when the king's fleet had been consumed by green fire. Devon was the fifth-born, and safer here with her than at the king's side. Lord Davos would not thank her for it, no more than the boy himself, but it seemed to her that Seaworth had suffered enough grief. Davos, by this point, has repeatedly tried to turn Stannis against her, and deliberately foiled her plans, but she responds by trying to protect his son, because she doesn't want Davos to suffer any more. This is compassion. It's not a side of her we see much of, but it is a side to her nonetheless, and there are hints to it elsewhere. The first time we see her, when Maester Cresson tries to poison her and himself, she tries to talk him down, and we're told, looks down at him in pity as he dies, not in malice and happiness at the defeat of a rival. And later, she asks after Davos's well-being in prison, when she could have just been happy that a rival was out of the way. So, 
Although it is quite a low moral bar, it seems that she doesn't go out of her way to hurt people for the sheer pleasure of it, and when she can and it doesn't hurt her plans, she does care. Which brings us to the heart of Melisandre's character. She honestly thinks she is doing the right thing. She thinks that she has an important role to play in saving humanity, a very important role. In her point of view chapter, we see her feeling, and this is a quote, the weight of the world upon her shoulders, and thinking of Stannis as the king who carried the fate of the world upon his shoulders. George R. R. Martin is not one to throw out lazy idioms, so we can be sure that she really does think that the fate of the world rests with her and Stannis. In this context, she sees the fates of individuals as almost unimportant or irrelevant, and she is also willing to suffer herself for this. One time, her ruby burned so hot as she performed magic that she feared her own flesh would blacken and smoke. When she sees visions in the flames, she feels agony. Blood trickles down her legs, and she seems tormented by her past. Shimmers of heat traced patterns on her skin, insistent as a lover's hand. Strange voices called to her from days long past. Melanie, she heard a woman cry. A man's voice called, Lot Seven. She was weeping, and her tears were flame, and still she drank it in. One day, Melisandre prayed, she would not sleep at all. One day she would be free of dreams. Melanie, she thought. Lot Seven. This is all we have, but it seems that she had been sold into slavery as a child, ripped from her mother, and the memory of it burns her and plagues her dreams. It's one of the reasons she doesn't want to sleep. And all this she hides from the world, never allowing anyone in because she thinks the cause is more important than her own well-being. In her mind, she has a burden to bear on behalf of humanity. No one must see her as weak or vulnerable or doubting in any way. People may think her evil, but if she saves humanity, then it doesn't matter to her what people think of her. There's more than a hint of misguided tragedy to her, particularly when you realise that some of what she believes is true. There is an existential threat to humanity coming from the North. The Seven Kingdoms is not ready, and it does need a strong leader to face up to the others. Of course, all of this doesn't make her a good person or excuse her actions, but it does make her three-dimensional and morally complex, as we have come to expect from all of George R. R. Martin's characters. George R. R. Martin says she is one of the most misunderstood characters in The Song of Ice and Fire, and on reflection, it's easy to see why. We think of her as a red priestess, but she's probably a heretic to the faith. We think of her as a human with magical powers, but she's probably not very human at all anymore. And we think of her as a two-dimensional religious zealot, and although she certainly is a zealot, she is a long way from being two-dimensional. In addition to which, and I'll probably explore this in more depth in other videos, there is a very real chance that she is championing a god and uses a source of magic that is not exactly what she thinks it is, against a great evil that is also not what she thinks it is. In short, nothing about her is as it seems to us or to her. All of which is supposed to leave us slightly unnerved and uncertain about how to view her. Melisandre is honestly trying to save humanity from a great evil, which is undoubtedly a good intention. She is the hero in her own story, but she is misguided to an horrific extent and does many, many terrible things. And because of Melisandre's power and influence, her actions are even more impactful than most others. This moral complexity is typical in the world of Ice and Fire. This isn't a world of moral absolutes, but of shades of grey. But what do you think? What do you make of Melisandre? And why do you think George R. R. Martin thinks that she is so misunderstood? Let me know in the comments below. If you'd like to see more videos about A Song of Ice and Fire, please click on the link on the left of your screen. Or to support this channel, the best way to do that is via Patreon, the link on the right of your screen. Thanks for watching. That's all for this time. I'll see you again soon.